Dear God, it's been quite a morning, and I just ask that you come into this place, center our hearts on worshiping you, help us to hear these words. Lord, if I have anything that's worth listening to, I just ask that you open their hearts to hear. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together, Lord, be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. I love a good proposal story. <clears throat> Guys all nervous, girls all excited, the surprise, the ring, the happiness, etc., etc. So I asked permission. I don't know where she is. She's somewhere. Um, and so I'd like to open this sermon by telling you our proposal story, how I asked my incredible girlfriend to become my amazing wife. Now, um, I'd already... I. At this time, I was living in Chicago, and I had already started my first semester in seminary. Um, Sarah was still living in Grand Rapids. We were doing the whole long-distance relationship thing, which was rough. Um, so I was doing my first semester in seminary, and we we talked about marriage, so we knew where we were headed as a couple. So I didn't really have the element of surprise, which is kind of my favorite part of the whole proposal thing, right? I like that element of surprise, but I didn't think I was going to surprise her. So what I did was I organized a surprise party for all our friends and family, starting right after the proposal. I was really banking on her saying yes. <laughs> um, now, in Grand Rapids that weekend, there was this big art festival called Art Prize. It still goes on every year. Uh, this was like the first or second year that they ever did it. Um, and so my excuse for coming into town was, I'm coming into town, we'll go to the art festival, it'll be a good time. And it was supposed to be a big date night. And what we were going to do is we'd go downtown, do the proposal, we'd come back, surprise, all our friends and family would be there, the roommates were decorating the whole place. Um, she, she was living with a couple of roommates at the time. So it was supposed to be a big date night. We're getting ready, and you know, I've got my fedora because I'm ridiculous, and I get my suit on. And the problem with modern suits is that the ring boxes are so bulky. They're so big. Why are they so big and square? And I couldn't put it in my pocket without it, you know, like it was really obvious I had something in my pocket. So I... <laughs> I took the ring out of the box and put it in my pocket. <laughs> now those of you who know my history with rings, this is just a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> but we made it, we did all right. We go downtown, went and saw a bunch of art exhibits, and then we went to Sarah's favorite sushi restaurant in downtown Grand Rapids. Uh, it was called Murado's. And I gotta tell you, it is so awkward trying to sit there and have a conversation with a ring in your pocket. How are you supposed to talk and make small talk when all you can think of is, what am I supposed to do this? When do I do it? When do I do it? When am I supposed to do this? What am I supposed to do? When, when, when do I do this? Do I put it in her food? That's kind of gross. Do I put it in her drink? What if she swallows it? Do I get down on one knee? What if I drop it? <laughs> and I was waiting for the perfect moment. I just kept waiting for the perfect moment. And before I know it, the meal's over. We're paying the bill. We're, we're putting our coats on. We're getting ready to leave. Now, I don't want to be rushed, but I've got to ask this question. i got a whole house full of people waiting for us back home. So I casually suggest, as we're headed out to the car, hey, why don't we go for a walk down by the river? Why don't we, you know, we'll see some more art exhibits or something, I don't know. So we go and we walk and we see a few more exhibits and we go and we're walking down by the river, which is just beautiful. If you're ever in Grand Rapids, take a walk down by the riverfront. And I kept waiting for the perfect moment. I wanted, you know, the, the skies to part and the light to come down and say, this is it right now, do it. And it just didn't come. That perfect moment just never came. And so eventually we, we hit this stretch of sidewalk. And I, and I figured it out. I knew what I was going to say. So I turned to Sarah. And I said, do you recognize this place? She kind of looked around. I was like, you, you don't recognize this place? She said, no, should I? I said, well, this is the place where I'm going to ask you to marry me. And boom, before that sinks in, I'm down on one knee. And here we are today, waiting for the perfect moment. That wasn't going to work. We have to make our moments perfect. You can't wait for the perfect moment. Today is part two of a Christmas series called Advent Wisdom. Today we're going to continue our study of King Solomon and his wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. Today we're talking about timing. Now timing is an interesting topic because it literally there are no limits to the application. It applies to everything we do in our lives. And so we get started in um, chapter 11, verse 1. And it says in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, uh, Give generously, for your gifts will return to you later. Now the actual text says, Send your bread out over the water. 
and eventually profits will come back to you. It's, it's like international trade advice. Now it's a very strange thing for Solomon to be giving us international trade advice, but if you think about it, the core is actually very similar to our theme for this year. Today's footprint is tomorrow's legacy. What, you you got to put stuff out there if you want to get profit, if you want to get return on your investment. Um, now, what we do today determines what tomorrow is going to look like. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes, we call him the teacher. A lot of people agree that it was Solomon. Uh, this guy, he's not a trader. He's not an international you know, trader. Um, he was not a, a deal maker. He was not a farmer. He was using the metaphor of trade to make a point. You've got to put stuff out there if you want anything in return. Today's footprint is tomorrow's, and, um, <laughs> tomorrow's legacy. Thank you, thank you. Tomorrow's <laughs> legacy. Solomon was making a point with that. And so if you, uh, that's just solid advice for everything we do in life. They can be talking about actually planting things in the ground. They can be talking about investing in your kid's life and, and building relationships. They can be talking about your actual job at your place of work. They can be talking about just about anything. Today's footprint is tomorrow's legacy. Live your life in such a way that tomorrow, or five years from now, or 20 years from now, you will be grateful to the younger version of yourself. And then it continues in verse 2. It says in verse 2, it says, Divide your gifts among many, for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. Now this is very simple. Plant your seeds, absolutely. Put it out there, plant your seeds, but don't put all your eggs in one basket. And this is just really solid advice. Don't live a lopsided life. You need balance. Life requires balance. A great example of this is exercise. Working out, right? Taking care of your body. If you only exercise like half your body, or only, only exercise like one muscle group, that half or that muscle group is going to be all beefy and muscular and fit, but you're going to literally be living a lopsided life. It's not going to work, right? You're going to look kind of weird. Have you ever seen those pictures of the guys who work out their arms with skip leg day? <laughs> You're going to live a lopsided life beyond just exercise. Bodily health isn't just one category, is it? It's not just how you exercise. It's also what you eat. It's how you rest. It's all these different pieces. Life requires balance. And obviously this is a metaphor for everything we do in life. Life requires balance. Divide your event investments among many places. And so we keep reading verse 3 and 4. It says, when the clouds are heavy, the rains come down. When a tree falls, whether south or north, there it lies. And if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. Now, in the other translation, it said, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. You can't wait for the perfect moment because it doesn't exist. You can't wait for the perfect moment. You have to make the moments perfect. When is the right time to change your life? Right now. When is the time to talk about that thing that you've been meaning to talk about with your friend, that one friend who's having that one issue? Right now. When is the time to heal your relationship with your kid, or your parent, or your brother, or whoever? Right now. We don't wait. We can't wait for the perfect moment. If you wait for perfect weather, you'll never plant the seeds. And if you never plant the seeds, you will never harvest. What's Wayne Gretzky's most famous quote? You miss 100% of the shots that you never take. King Solomon says, don't wait for the perfect moment. You have to get out there and make the moments perfect. Now this is huge. Now, I'm not saying don't consider all your options. I'm not saying you know don't, don't be patient and take your time and do the due diligence. But once you've done that, go. Don't wait. Get out there and do something. Um, so we switch over to our second scripture lesson for today in Luke. And we kind of got to check in on the Christmas story. It is Advent after all. And it's a fairly familiar story. It's the angel telling, um, angel telling Mary that she's pregnant. We all know the story, but I want to reread it for you this morning, thinking about timing. Because what I found this past week is that I think God chose the most inconvenient time ever. And I think he did it on purpose. Let's, let's take a look. Let's, let's read this. So in verse 31 says, confused and disturbed, Mary tried to understand what the angel could mean. Don't be frightened, Mary, the angel said, for God has decided to bless you. You will become pregnant and have a son. And you're in the name of Jesus, and he will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him a throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. But Mary asked the angel, how can, this, how can I have a baby? I am a virgin. How can I have a baby? I'm still a virgin, and not just a virgin, an engaged virgin, right? There is a man in her life, Joseph. If God had chosen her, 
a couple months earlier, like before she got engaged, it still would have been a miracle. But Jesus might have grown up without a father figure. Do you think Joseph really would have married Mary if she had been pregnant with a mystery father? That's really difficult to look at. But if he had just waited a couple of months the other way, it would have solved all of Mary's problems. I wonder if Mary ever thought about that. Oh, man, if God had just waited a couple of months, or like a year, nobody would have been suspicious. Nobody would have been upset about it. And my fiancé wouldn't be trying to dump me. Right? I mean, we'd have an angel show up in a dream to keep Joseph from dropping her. I wonder if Mary thought about that. Such inconvenient timing. And not just the virgin thing. Right? If God had gone a couple months one way or the other, there wouldn't be a giant census going on at the same time. Right? Think about this. They could have had a hotel room, maybe even a doctor, if God had just waited a couple of months. But God didn't wait for the perfect timing. God took the moment that was there and made it perfect. He took the moment that was there and made it perfect. And Mary's response at the end of the day, I love it. She comes, Mary, and she's so confused. She's probably really stressed out, realizing that this is going to cause some problems in her relationship. This is going to cause some problems with her life. There's this sense that she's going to have to travel while pregnant. She's probably realizing all of this, but then she goes, I am the Lord's servant, and I am willing to accept whatever she wants. May everything you have said come true. She just, at the end of the day, she said, right, this is majorly inconvenient. This timing is terrible. But I'm your servant. Trust your timing. It seems inconvenient to me, but it also seems like God can work with inconvenient timing. The good news this morning is that God perfects every moment. God perfects every moment. In verse 5 it says, uh, back in Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 11 verse 5, it says, God's ways are as hard to discern as the pathways of the wind. They are as mysterious as a tiny baby being formed in a mother's womb. Simply put, we can we cannot understand God's timing. We can't understand the activity of God who does all things. Let me ask you a question. Do you guys believe in coincidences? It's an honest question. I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. When I was younger, I believed in coincidence, right? I thought, yeah, something's just happened. It's just a coincidence. But the longer I've been in ministry, as I've done this, I just, man, it's getting harder and harder for me to believe. Maybe some things are coincidence. Maybe as I watch the way the pieces of the world come together. But man, it's getting hard to believe in that. Here's an example. You guys remember Baby Grayson? You remember the story? For those who don't know, uh, Baby Grayson was born about seven months ago. Um, and he was very premature. He was born with a lot of complications. He was supposed to be born weeks after my son. But he actually came two weeks before Liam did. And he was born with all these complications. He's been down in Ann Arbor basically since the day he was born with his mother, Caitlin. Just a couple of weeks ago, he had the, the open heart surgery. Now, he's, he's getting stronger every single day. He's getting better. But it has been such a long road, and we have so much farther to go. And the hardest part about this whole thing is that Caitlin, the mother, has to be downstate for months at a time, so far away from work and family and her support system and everything. And so the family came to me, and they asked me, um, they said, could you maybe look up who are the Methodist pastors in that area? we got 800 churches in the state of Michigan. We've got to have a couple pastors that are close enough, right? So could you just maybe find out if you know a couple of them? Maybe they can go visit her, provide support, something, right? Could you, could you look into who the pastors are down there? I said, all right, I'll look into the pastors in Ann Arbor. But as time goes on, they're starting to talk about leaving the hospital with baby Grayson. You know, they're getting to that point where they can leave the hospital, but they have to stay close. They can't come all the way back yet. They have to stay down there for like a month. It's, it's a long time. So they found Caitlin in an apartment. They found Caitlin in an apartment in a city called Waterford, Michigan. Yeah, there's a church in Waterford, Michigan. They got a pretty cool pastor. His name's Pastor Jack. I call him Dad. <laughs> what a coincidence. What a coincidence. Another one of those coincidences that I hear about all the time is this, these sermons, these messages. I get people who come up to me after services, and they're always saying, did you know about my situation? Did you know what I was going through at that time? And I just, it felt like your words spoke to me. And that does my heart good. It really makes me feel amazing that God is working through these silly little things that I say, and that it's actually reaching people, and that's awesome. But I realized a couple of months ago, people think that's me. People think that when the words connect to their heart, that's like me being clever. Let me just, that, that is ridiculous. Let me pop that bubble right now. I put, 
I am not that clever. I wish. I put my sermon series together a year in advance. I had every sermon picked out, not written, but picked out from now until June, right? I go June to June, years at a time. I have no idea who's going to be here this week. I have no idea how this is going to connect. I just do this. I am just not that good at my job. So if you ever think that JJ's just being really clever, if you ever think, wow, he knew exactly what I needed to hear at this moment and this time, that's not me. I have no idea what's going on in your life. I don't know. That is all God. we got to give credit where credit is due. The timing, it's all God. It's all God. So do you believe in coincidence? I'm not mad at you if you do. I, personally, I'm finding it really hard to believe in coincidence. We cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. We can't understand the activity of God. It continues in verse 6. It says, be sure to stay busy and plant a variety of crops. You never know which ones are going to grow. Perhaps they all will. That's not talking about crops there. Plant your seed in the morning and stay busy all afternoon. You never know what's going to grow. The core message for today is that God perfects each moment. And what that means for us is we got to get to work. we got to get out there and do stuff. Don't wait for the perfect moment because it doesn't exist. Make the moment perfect. The perfect moment is right now. Let God perfect your moments. We can't know which things in our lives that God's going to use for his purpose. So we just keep working. Indecision will paralyze us. Indecision will paralyze us. It keeps us from doing everything. A lot of times there's this that we have in our lives. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to do the wrong thing. And we, then we let into, we don't know what to do. And so then we just do nothing. And indecision paralyzes us. We are so afraid of negatively affecting someone that we are paralyzed. But the teacher in Ecclesiastes says, don't. Don't worry about it. Put the good stuff out there. Do the absolute best you can. You can't know if profit's going to come from one activity or the other. Or maybe both. Plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon. You never know. Do something with your life. Let me see if I can explain it this way. Imagine, imagine that you have a bank account. And every morning, this bank gives you $86,000. They deposit $86,000 into your bank account every single day. But at the end of the day, they cancel the account. They, they, they cut all the money that you don't use. They take it out of the account. And you don't know what day they're going to stop doing that. Like, they're going to do it every day, but you don't know when they're going to stop. Right? Imagine that you get $86,000 deposited into your account every single day, but anything you don't use, you lose. What would you do? I'd pull out every penny, right? Pull it out and start using it every day. So how much good could you do with $86,000 every single day? Well, there is such a bank. We call it time. Every single day, we are given a gift of 86,400 seconds. We can't, you, we don't know when that bank's going to close. You can't, you can't save them up from yesterday. You can't borrow on tomorrow. Every single day, we are given 86,400 seconds to make a difference. If you fail to use the day's deposit to spend your time, the loss is yours. There's no going back. There's no borrowing against tomorrow. Now, there's this quote out there, but it's anonymous, so I don't know who to give credit to, but this isn't me. Um, we master our minutes, we become slaves to them. We use time, or time will use us. So which would you rather have? Plant your seed in the morning and stay busy all through the afternoon. This is our application to get out there and do something with your time. You can't wait for the perfect moment. That's, that's the path to nothing to wasting your time waiting for something that doesn't exist. Don't wait for the perfect moment. Make your moments perfect. Whatever it is you're dealing with in your life, whatever it is you've been putting off, that conversation, that difficult conversation you don't want to have, you can't wait for the perfect moment. You've got to make your moments perfect. But of course, as soon as we say that, then the questions start coming in. What if? What if, what if, what if all the fear and indecisive insecurity start rising up in our lives? What if I do the wrong thing? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I plant the wrong seed at the wrong time in the wrong place? What if I fail? <laughs> yeah, that's very possible. I'm not going to get up here this morning and tell you you're going to succeed at everything, but I would so much rather be a part of a group of people who try and fail than a group of people that never, ever try. 
I, I, want, to, I want to acknowledge those fears. I want, to, I want you to understand that's real. We could fail. That fail. That's legitimate. I don't want this call to action to be a call to careless action. We should move forward with wisdom. Don't be rash or cavalier. Do your due diligence. But then once you've done all the due diligence, don't forget the final step. Get out there and do something. We give it everything we've got and leave the rest to God. Do your best and trust God for the timing. Trust God with everything else. There's this pastor out there, his name's Francis Chan. Um, he's just one of my personal heroes, he's an incredible man. And he points out how paralyzed people are in the church. Um, each week, we consume knowledge. We come to church and we consume, right? When we, we do our Bible studies and we read our Bibles and we read Christian books and we, um, and we, we listen to sermons and we listen to podcasts and we eat and we eat and we eat and we eat, but we never actually do anything. Francis Chan says, we don't need another feast on doctrine. We don't need another sermon. We need to work off the stuff we've already eaten. We need to get out there and exercise what we've eaten. So many of us, we will not do anything outside of our comfort zone unless God steps out of heaven to tell us to do it. Right? We default to negligence. We are so afraid of doing the wrong thing that we default to negligence. Do you guys do that? I do all the time. I default to negligence because I'm afraid of reaching out. I'm stepping into someone else's world. What if I offend them? What if I upset them? What if I, you know, you know, oh, you look like you need help. Well, I don't need help, and they get all mad at me. What if that happens? And so I default to nothing. I'll just I'll stay out of their business. I won't do anything. Francis Chan says, why not default to action until you hear a voice from God telling you to stop? Don't wait for him to part the heavens and come down and say, this is your moment. Wait for him to come down and say, stop it. I'm God, you're doing too much. I'd love to see that. We do our best, and we trust God for the rest. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5 says, God's ways are as hard to discern as the pathways of the wind, and they are as mysterious as a tiny baby being formed in a mother's womb. Six years ago, I asked my best friend to become my wife. If I had waited for the perfect moment, I'd still be standing on that sidewalk down by the river, and we'd be really late for that party. <laughs> you can't know how the ripples of your life will go. So we have to dive in head first and trust God for the rest. Trust God with the timing. And so I'll, I'll leave you with this. May you stop waiting. Stop waiting for the perfect moment whatever, in whatever you're doing. May you give it over to God, plant your seeds, and then trust Him with the timing. Let Him perfect everything.